Part of the reason why a lot of Green's books feel much more similar than they probably ought to has less to do with the fact that they're all YA fiction in the same genre, and more to do with the way that Green uses his narrators. You see, the criticism that John Green just writes the same story over and over again can be easily rebutted by pointing out the differences in both the story and characters on the surface level, as well as what each novel's primary themes are underneath all that. Now, while it's definitely true that Green recycles character archetypes between novels, the characters who fit each of those archetypes are otherwise reasonably varied. Miles is a different character to Quentin, is a different character to Hazel, is a different character to Arza. I could go into specifics, but I don't really think it's worth arguing the point. The story structure is very similar across the board. Green tends to transparently and consistently let various plot threads build up and coalesce, such that they telegraph that the story is going in one direction before some kind of shake up barrels in to careen the story in a different direction. Alaska dies, Augustus relapses, Quentin discovers Margot's location, and Arza crashes her car. The stories then take a turn in the final act to make a point about the ideas that were established and explored in the first half of the novel. You can't really criticise him for that though, unless you also want to hold that criticism over the overwhelming majority of all fiction. While the thematic interests of all of these novels might seem superficially similar in some ways, they're actually all looking at reasonably distinct ideas. Looking for Alaska wanted to talk about death, both in how just by being an inevitability it shapes our outlook upon the world and the meaning that we create for our lives, but also what happens when we are confronted with it directly and suddenly. The Fault in Our Stars was also interested in death, but approached it from the angle of people who knew in advance that they were going to die when they're young, which springboarded into a conversation about authorship. The character of Peter Van Houten is used to very explicitly talk about authorship as it relates to stories, but the implicit connection between this idea and the plight of Hazel is how much her terminal disease cuts away at her potential to author the story of her life, which isn't exactly the same idea that Turtles All the Way Down was kicking around. This novel is much more interested in talking about a person as an independently thinking agent, which is what I'm referring to as self-authorship rather than do we have authorship over the story of our lives, it's do we have authorship over ourselves. And Paper Towns was fucking awful. So all the novels are sufficiently different, or at least the ones that I've read. I didn't care much to read An Abundance of Catherines because the premise... <laughs> I don't want to read this. I don't want to read this. And I gave Will Grayson Will Grayson a go, but wasn't able to finish it due to supreme boredom. So even counting that the novels don't appear to be unusually more similar to each other than any multitude of stories that share a genre, style, and author, something that has in fact been consistently identical for all of these novels is how they are all focalized. Oh god, what have I done? If you value your future employability little enough to actually take a literature course, one of the first real technical concepts they teach you is focalization, which is basically just a fancy way of examining what perspective the reader has in the story. At its most basic, focalization can just refer to either a first or third person voice. Internal focalization means that our perspective is inside the narrator's mind, which is usually done through first person narration. Likewise, external focalization means that we're given a similar perspective to a camera in a film. We're following the protagonist, but we don't have complete access to their minds. Slightly less intuitively, focalization always tells us exactly whose perspective we're reading from and how that changes the scene. A great example of how focalization can influence meaning comes from that dead man dance, during the scene where the white settlers and the Noongar people exchange gifts as a gesture of amity between their peoples. And those who have read the novel will have to forgive me this gross oversimplification for the moment. We read this scene from the perspective of the settlers, and taking everything at face value, the ceremony goes smoothly and peoples are united without a hitch. However, if you read the scene with a critical eye, you'll notice several key pieces of symbolism that indicate that the gesture isn't exactly mutual, and the Noongar people end up sacrificing a lot more of their identity and culture than the settlers do in the exchange. The reason why the scene is focalised from a white perspective is because once you as the reader notice this, you then also know that the settlers didn't notice 
notice it, which is important for the story. Now, a story doesn't have to be focalized from just one perspective all the time, but unless you're using an omniscient narrator who can recall events without the need for a witness account, every part of the story, whether that be a chapter, a scene, or even an individual line, are always told from someone's perspective, and focalization is meant to help you think about what the reader's exact point of view means for the story. It's not just about first or third person voice, and it's not just about perspective. It's instead about how both of those things together are more than the sum of their parts, and considering this concept when talking about literature is a very good gateway to thinking about all of the creative ways that narrators can be used in stories. So if the novels are all otherwise sufficiently different from each other, how does the focalization lead people to perceiving them as the same story over and over again, especially since this criticism isn't usually thrown at other stories that use similar styles of narrator? Well, I've already argued that if you're primarily paying attention to the storytelling, you might find yourself frustrated with the fact that Green often sacrifices story for the sake of explaining his ideas. If that's true, then the similarities between focalization between the novels mean that those ideas and what story material is left over are all being delivered to the audience in exactly the same way. That might be enough to lose some readers, but what compounds this problem is that the focalization and the narrator can actually weaken the story that Green is attempting to tell. His narrator is sometimes used to full artistic effect, but more frequently is a mere utility for speaking to the reader. I'll use Turtles all the way down as an example for this because there are aspects to this novel that make the disagreement between narrateur and narrative exceptionally obvious. So then, Arza is a single first-person narrator and the narration is internally focalized. This means that the story never leaves the protagonist's point of view. The reader is meant to be occupying the protagonist's mind and therefore only witnesses what the protagonist witnesses during the events of the story. The story is temporally linear. The audience is given scenes in chronological order. When scenes are told out of order, it's because the protagonist is briefly recorded calling or remembering past events within a scene in the main story. The time over which the main story takes place is a short span of time within which all the significant events of the story happen. This minimizes time skips where we jump forward in time so that we're engaging with a story that takes place over the day to day. Now there's actually nothing right or wrong with any of this, but these axes do provide the framework for the story which dictates a lot of things. For example, if the narrator is internally focalized in the perspective of just one of the characters, and that character is only telling you of things that happened during a specific time frame, then the author has to justify how that character knows everything that they recount to the reader. If the narrator didn't personally witness an event happen, they have to have gotten an account of the event from another source, or else it makes no sense how they could tell of the event to the reader, unless of course that narrator is unreliable. I don't have any reason to believe that Arza is an unreliable narrator, at least when it comes to the material events of the story, so this actually does restrict how the story can be told when we consider the relationship between a couple of axes on that framework that I outlined earlier. This framework is very good for telling a deeply personal story, as the reader will be effectively trapped within one perspective for the entire novel. For a story that's about the experience of mental illness, it's probably a strong choice if you want to really focus on the personal story of the sufferer. By far, the strongest part of this novel is that when significant story beats are happening, the reader is forced to observe these through the warped lens of Arza's anxiety because the focalization draws us into Arza's perspective, and the fact that we never get given a different perspective helps us stay there and immerse ourselves. The story was set up to be an intense, personal character study about a girl who spends her life trapped in her own thoughts, and there are parts of this story that deliver on something like that. Unfortunately, a lot of the story material in this novel actually draws us outside of Arza's mind and into the world. There's actually a lot of focus on the side cast, including several prominent subplots belonging to 
other characters. The result of this is that during scenes that focus on something other than Arza's story, I'm not visualizing it from Arza's perspective. I'm instead seeing it from the perspective of either an observer or a camera. My perspective as the reader is pulled out of Arza's mind and into a more film-like point of view. This is especially true in scenes with heavy dialogue. At those points, you can actually sense the effectiveness of the narrator Wayne as we're drawn out of Arza's mindset and into the story's setting instead. I think there's a discrepancy between the nature of the subplots and the type of narrator used by Green to communicate this story. It would be a tall order to accept that Arza just happens to be around to personally witness all of the major beats of any of the B stories, so Green is kind of forced to have them mostly take place off screen, for lack of a better term. Consider Daisy and Michael's relationship, which gets introduced like this. I ran upstairs and walked along a hallway until I could hear Daisy talking behind a closed door. I opened it. Daisy and Michael were kissing in a large four-poster bed. Um, I said. A bit of privacy, please? Daisy asked. I closed the door, muttering, Well, but it isn't your house and gets developed through some small moments in the story like this. Right, I know, I said, and before I could say anything else, she spotted Michael across the parking lot and ran off to hug him. And gets concluded like this. So I know what you're wondering. Daisy, are you still dating Michael? Where's your car? What happened to your hair? The answers are no, sold. And a cut became necessary after Eleanor intentionally put three pieces of chewed bubble gum in my hair while I was sleeping. Okay, I I know this is played as a joke, but A, it's not funny, and B, the whole thing just kind of hints at side story rather than actually being a side story. I'm pretty sure it was never Green's intent to make a substantive arc out of this, but in that case, surely he would have cut this material for being pointless filler. Assuming that they were included because we're supposed to care about this jokey side story even a little bit, incorporating it into the novel through Arza's perspective is most likely going to be ineffective effective or contrived. It's a romantic relationship between two characters who are never the point of focalization, so unless Arza personally witnesses their most intimate moments, which would be weird, or Daisy runs her mouth and just spontaneously tells Arza about their most intimate moments at some point during the main story, which is (laughs) actually that's exactly what happens. Another reason Michael and I were doomed... He doesn't want to have sex unless he's in love. And yes, I know that virginity is a misogynistic and oppressive social construct, but I still want to lose it. And meanwhile, I've got this boy hemming and whoring like we're in a Jane Austen novel. I wish boys didn't have all these feelings. I have to manage like a fucking psychiatrist. Ha ha, it's hilarious that this girl is reversing what we expect to happen between men and women. I'm rolling on the floor laughing at how the girl broke up with the boy because the boy didn't want to have sex right away, but the girl wanted to be unrestrained in her sex life. That's so funny because usually it's the opposite. Oh my god, I'm dying over here, my sides are split. Ha 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 Is it just me, or did this entire B story come off as really mean-spirited towards the character of Michael? Like, fucking Daisy actually gets an emotional arc and a payoff in this novel, but Michael is more or less fucking paced and then just gets shafted at the end. Why would you write this? What the fuck? That's probably an example that nobody cares about, but it's the clearest example of this problem in the text that I could find, and this same limitation applies to other side characters as well. The character of Noah is detached and antisocial whenever Arza is interacting with him, but we're told repeatedly by Davis that Noah is struggling with their father's disappearance. Davis gives us his speculations on the inner workings of Noah's emotions, and it's highly probable that we were supposed to be somewhat emotionally invested in this, but Noah's story isn't really told to the reader. There comes one scene where Noah opens up a little bit, but all in all, his emotional conflict and the interesting parts of his character character are left untold by the novel. You could say that because Noah is closed off emotionally, that illustrates how often people who are struggling can suffer silently in their minds, but Arza supports that idea as well and is already the central focus of the text. Because we barely see anything of Noah, it doesn't feel like any point surrounding him was well made or that there was anything to the point other than the surface observation. Davis tells us that Noah is struggling because he idolised his father, and the fact that his father ran away, in contrast 
sacrifice to Arza's father who passed away felt almost like an abandonment or a betrayal and that Noah is secretly hoping that his father will come back to tell him that he hadn't abandoned him all along. That's a nice idea, I guess, but the way this is expressed in Noah's character is by having him just be closed off and rude, which doesn't really take full advantage of that idea for his character. Here's the bit where Noah opens up a little to Arza. I turned to leave, but then he said, Aza? I walked over to him and sat next to him on the couch. Nobody wants to find him. Your dad, you mean. It's like I can't think about anything else. I... It's... Do you think, like, he would really disappear and not even text us? Do you think maybe he's trying and we just haven't figured it out how to listen? I felt so bad for the kid. Yeah, maybe, I said. Or maybe he's just waiting until it's safe. Right, Noah said. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks. I was starting to stand up when he said, But couldn't he have sent an email? They can't trace that stuff if you just use public Wi-Fi. Couldn't he have texted us from a phone he picked up somewhere? Maybe he's scared, I said. I was trying to help, but maybe there was no helping. Will you keep looking, though? Yeah, I said. Yeah, sure, Noah. He reached over to pick up his video game controller, my sign to go back downstairs. In narrative terms, this is a setup to a payoff. Noah wants Arza to find his father, and then she does, sort of. And you would think that once that happens, Noah would get a payoff, but the payoff gets given exclusively to Davis. It's just a note from his phone, though. You think he's just been down there this whole time, hiding in a sewer? Maybe, I said, but... Well, I don't know, but I don't want to worry you, but there was a bad smell, a really bad smell down there. That could have been anything, he said, but I could see the fear on his face. I know, yeah, totally, it could be anything. I never thought. I never let myself think. And then his voice caught. The cry that finally came out of him felt like the sky ripping open. He sort of fell into me, and I held him on the couch, felt his ribcage heave, it wasn't only Noah who missed his father. Oh God, he's dead, isn't he? What's the point of Noah's character if the emotional climax to the missing father story is given entirely to Davis, with Noah getting scarcely a mention? He isn't even seen in the last quarter of the novel. Like, this right here is how Noah's anguish over his father gets resolved. Why do you tell the cops to look down there? I asked. It was eating Noah up, not knowing. I realised... I guess I realised I had to be a big brother, you know. That's my full-time occupation now. That's who I am. And he needed to know why his father wasn't in touch with him more than he needed all the money. So that's what we did. He's not even in the scene! He ends up being an accessory to Davis's character instead. Like, I think I get why Green didn't show us the scene where Davis and Noah make the decision to call the police. That's a really intimate moment between those two characters, and Arza also being there just so the reader can get a first-hand account of the moment would be kinda weird and awkward. But the consequence of doing this is that the reader just misses out on all of the significant moments of Noah's character arc, and he ends up up feeling like less of a character and more like a character concept. It feels like I'm reading the mind map of Noah on John Green's whiteboard. As for Davis, he openly talks about his thoughts, feelings and experiences to Arza such that I thought it made him come across as kind of rude, self-centered and desperate. But it also didn't seem that was the intended way that I was supposed to view his character. I'm pretty sure that what I'm supposed to buy is that he and Arza trust each other to the degree that they're comfortable sharing these things but I actually think that he just runs his mouth to her because otherwise there would be no way for her to relay that information to the reader. I also half suspect that he keeps that stupid blog of his because Green had a lot planned for this character, but communicating all of it through dialogue scenes and text message conversations would make the ubiquity of it all way too obvious. You can see the problem emerge when you compare the structural axes of the story's focalization and the actual content that it's been tasked to deliver. Green writes a singular, internally focalized first-person narrator, which tends to be at its strongest when telling deeply personal and psychological stories of a singular character, but then he also includes a sizable cast of side characters, of whom multiple are actually quite prominent, and then gives them their own deeply personal ideas that they're attached to. However, because we're adopting an internal perspective from the point of view of Arza, this weakens the potential that the side characters have for a prominent and 
involved exploration of those ideas. While the side character's pulling focus ends up dragging the reader out of being immersed in Arza's mental state, the narrative of this ensemble story with side characters is ill-fitted to the narrateur of Arza Holmes. Now, you could say that the purpose behind this is to illustrate that many, many people suffer from psychological and emotional problems. You know, when Arza's trapped in her thoughts, she often frames her circumstance like she's unusual and she's the only person with something wrong and she can't have a normal life because she's not normal. Then, when we're pulled out of her perspective, we see that other characters are also suffering in their own ways. Arza's not the only person who suffers from mental health problems and it takes looking outside of herself in order to see that. Now, I think this reading is both defensible and useful, however, I don't believe that the story itself holistically points to that reading and in some ways it even contradicts it. First of all, if the novel is about how everyone is suffering in some way, why is Michael's emotional turmoil turned into a joke? Second, the structure of the story doesn't really let that reading naturally emerge, at least in relation to Davis and Noah, because we know from the start that they're suffering. The only character who really supports this reading of the text is Daisy, because she's set up to be the funny, quirky best friend character, and she spends a lot of time being this eccentric, wisecracking, goofy chick. But oh no, late into the book we find out that she's actually suffering from a lot of anxieties. That's what would make this reading work the revelation when we're pulled out of Arza's perspective that others are also suffering. But this really only applies to Daisy. When Arza declares that she's not normal or that there's something wrong with her specifically, we have Davis and Noah available right from the first act as counterpoints to say, no, actually, there are others who are having it bad as well and you are very aware of that. This reading of the text would be far stronger if we spent a lot more time trapped in Arza's perspective near the beginning beginning of the text and then through the second act, we're pulled out of her perspective and into the world, maybe that could symbolise Arza slowly emerging from her thought spirals. And then we're revealed the plights of the side characters who we assumed were doing okay. I'm not saying this is definitely what the book should have done, but that's an example of how this book would be better geared towards a reading like that specifically. As it is now, you have to spend a lot of time trying to piece together this reading yourself from a kinda abstract perspective. And and then you have to choose to ignore a couple of contrary elements in order to accept that reading. So I can't say that the novel entirely succeeded if that's indeed what it was going for. There are a few ways to try and address the narrator problem, although, since the problem is structural, all of them sound like they'd take a gargantuan effort in redrafting, but here goes. You could write the story in such a way that all of the deeply personal ideas surrounding suffering and mental health are only explored through Arza's character and have the side characters act mainly as a flat supporting cast to Arza's story. That way you can keep the reader immersed in Arza's perspective throughout the novel and have a greater potential for deeply exploring all of your main ideas. If you were dead set on having a prominent cast of round side characters, then adopt a polyphonic narrator who can jump between the perspectives of the characters. You could even do something like extremely loud and incredibly close and have each character who explores a notable idea be the narrator to their own story. There's also a third fix that the novel itself actually touches on. That's weird, but let me explain. The entire story is written in a teen voice, and the narrator's speech techniques change in accordance with the scene. The style implies that the narrator is recounting their thoughts and experiences as they happened. Even though the novel is written in past tense, you're supposed to feel like it's happening right now as you're reading it. Which is a popular style of narration in contemporary novels, I think mainly because it emulates the feeling of visual media like film and television. And if you're familiar with my video on grief is the thing with feathers, then you probably already know my opinion on this. Now, there is actually another element to the narrator of Turtles All the Way Down that I haven't mentioned yet, but trust me, it doesn't change that much about the main story. According to the end of the novel, Arza is writing the story as an adult, but the character whom she is directly addressing is her younger self, as she was during the events of the story. But it turns out not to be terrible, because I know the secret that the me lying beneath that sky could not imagine. I know that girl would go on, that she would grow up, have children and love them, that despite loving them she would get too sick to care for them, be hospitalised, get better, and then sick again. I know a shrink would say, write it down, how you got here. 
so you would. And in writing it down, you realise love is not a tragedy or a failure or a gift. You remember your first love because they show you, prove to you, that you can love and be loved, that nothing in this world is deserved except for love, that love is both how you become a person and why. Now, up until that reveal, the reader is probably assuming that Arza is narrating the story as a teenager because of this in-the-moment style of voice, and there's nothing that I noticed which would lead the reader to thinking otherwise, but if I missed any obvious clues, let me know in the comments. In my opinion, excluding this angle until the very end of the novel actually hurts the initial reading of the text because the explicit discussion of the ideas, random musings, and thesis statements that I've complained about a lot already are framed as the exact thoughts and feelings that Arza was having at the time. When you introduce adult Arza as the narrator, you can reasonably infer that she's trying to reconcile her experiences both emotionally and existentially well after the events of the story. This becomes even more clear when teen Arza struggles to articulate herself in the dialogue, but for some reason manages to articulate herself very well in the narration. Which was a nice touch, by the way. It gives the novel a more reflective tone, which does make the explicit discussions of the themes much less jarring on a second reading, but I was still very frustrated with them on my initial reading. If I hadn't made the decision to write a video on this novel, I would have only read it once and never gone back to reread parts of it expressly to analyse them, so I would have completely missed this. I think it's reasonable to expect that most people won't give books they didn't enjoy a second reading, so I can still only see this as a negative. I think the way to solve this would have been to simply make it explicit that adult Arza is the narrator at the beginning of the story so that we know her muse in the narration are being articulated by an adult. I really don't think that anything would be sacrificed with this change. I know the novel is primarily speaking to a teenager audience, but I'm fairly confident that teenagers don't need to be exclusively spoken to by characters with a teen voice. The Vlog Brothers themselves are evidence to that. The Green Brothers are fully grown adults with families and everything, and they can engage and speak to a teen audience easily enough. As the novel currently stands, it might as well just have had a teen narrator anyway, because if you cut the bit at the end where adult Arza is speaking to teen Arza, I'm pretty sure nobody would think that anything was missing from the novel. Except, you know, a meaty story and decent writing. The inclusion of adult Arza at the end is so insubstantial that a reviewer who liked it could only think up one reason why it was good that had nothing to do with the rest of the story. But I actually think that if Green had wanted to expand the focal point of the story so that it could support and explore these prominent side characters while still retaining that deeply personal singular narrator, adult Arza provides a very elegant framework for telling the exact same story while also being able to incorporate the wider breadth of perspectives and ideas that aren't as well supported by his current narrator. If adult Arza was able to reunite with and talk to the other characters in her adult years, that would give Green the opportunity to break away from teen Arza's perspective and tell us things that Arza herself didn't personally witness during that time frame, while still keeping to a singular narrator with that deeply personal angle. You can justify by having adult Arza say, for example, I met with Daisy while writing this and she told me about the conversation between her and Michael that led to their impromptu relationship. But, you know, better than I just did. That would give Green a much better way of incorporating that scene and many others without Arza personally witnessing them. He wouldn't need to play Noah's character arc off screen. Instead, he could have adult Arza get the first-hand account from Davis or Noah so that she can tell it to the reader. You can also play this framework to the themes of dissociation, mental illness, self-authorship, and even how humans use language to express themselves. For example, if you were able to incorporate Daisy's perspective into the story, you can use that to explore how both Daisy and Arza would differently describe identical accounts of events. Maybe they don't necessarily disagree about what literally happened, but the difference in language they both use could betray their biases and strengthen their characterization. I know they argue and spill their guts to each other before Arza crashes her car in that one scene, and that's kind of a similar idea to what I just said, but in that case they're kind of just telling each other what for and fucking tell it as a story, man! Use 
the fucking form of the medium. How many times have I got to say this? You could actually have each of the characters give conflicting accounts of the same events. You know, I already mentioned that the disorder tries to delegitimize Arza's happiness in the past. Why not also make Arza doubt her own recollection of the story? That could feed into the self-authorship themes, because if you have two or three conflicting accounts of events, then how do you trust your own memories about who you were in the past? How important are your memories in defining who you are right now and if they're vitally important, does someone contradicting your account of what you experienced in the past undermine who you are in the present? You could even have an uplifting message about how we actually do have some authorship over ourselves because we decide how we tell our own stories, if you want to go that route. There's so much potential that explodes out of stories when you consider different frameworks. I should be clear, Green does not just write the same book over and over again, but it's actually very easy to see why that complaint emerges so often. The reason why Green's stories can sometimes feel a bit stale and samey is that because Green's frameworks for his narrators are for all intents and purposes completely identical, he ends up trying to explore all of these divergent themes and narratives in the same way, by tying them to the mundane adventures of ordinary teenagers, and if he can't do that convincingly, he just has the characters and narrator discuss them as topics of interest instead. If Green were more willing to play around with the various properties of his narrator, he'd have greater potential to find more ways to explore those ideas using storytelling and literary form. Here's how Arza's obsession with piercing the skin on her finger and reapplying a bandage to it is introduced into the story on page 5. Ever since I was little, I've pressed my right thumbnail into the finger pad of my middle finger, and so now there's this weird callus over my fingerprint. After so many years of doing this, I can open a crack in the skin really easily, so I cover it up with a band-aid to try to prevent infection. But sometimes I get worried that there already is an infection, and so I need to drain it. And the only way to do that is to reopen the wound and press out any blood that will come. Once I start thinking about splitting the skin apart, I literally cannot not do it. I apologise for the double negative, but it's a real double negative of a situation, a bind which negating the negation is truly the only escape. Do you see what the problem here is? This right here is a story, or at least it could be a story. No, scratch that. It should be a story. John Green could have, for example, written a scene where Arza as a child first breaks open the skin on her finger and it becomes a habit, not knowing that it's a symptom of her developing disorder until it's too late and her finger cutting becomes a persistent problem. He could have actually written out a condensed story that was engaging and interesting to read through, but instead Arza summarises this habit of hers in a paragraph as just a character trait that she has. This isn't story material, this is a character factoid delivered by the character. Hello reader, my name is Arza. Let me tell you about my various character traits. This right here could have been an opportunity for Green to expand upon the novel's themes with storytelling methods. This isn't even the only time in the novel where he does this either. He does this again when he reveals adult Arza at the end of the novel. He tells us that she grows up, has children, gets debilitatingly sick while raising her family, continues to seek therapy in her adult years, and decides to write a book. That right there is also a story. Tell me this story! And look, it's not like Green has to write a full chapter on every peripheral detail, but I mean, for the particular details that he spends a good paragraph explaining anyway, he could use that paragraph to convey the same information through storytelling. And, and, he's not ignorant to this technique. There are examples in this book, where he uses a brief story to make the peripheral information more interesting. One example is that birthday memory I broke down in part two, but also when Arza recalls the memory of her father suddenly and tragically passing away. When he fell, his headphones were still playing music. I do remember that. He was listening to some old soul song, and it was coming out of his earbuds loud his body on its side. He was just lying there. The lawnmower stopped, not far from the one tree in our front yard. Mom told me to call 911, and I did. I told the operator my dad had fallen. She asked if he was breathing, and I asked Mum, and she said no, and the whole time this totally incongruous soul song was crooning timidly through his earbuds. Mum kept doing CPR on him until the ambulance came. He was dead the whole time, but we didn't know. We didn't know for sure until a doctor opened the door to the windowless hospital family room 
where we were waiting and said, did your husband have a heart condition? Past tense. Okay, it's not like a lengthy or meaty scene or anything, but there's some action and tension. There are characters who are only in this passage, like the call operator and the doctor. The action of the scene is also quite fast. When her mother tells her to call emergency services, Arza is already talking to the operator in the next sentence. It doesn't describe her rushing into the house to get a phone and then fiddling with the buttons before waiting on bated breath as the precious seconds go by for someone to answer. It just gives us the relevant beat. That's really good, concise action for a novel in general, but this whole excerpt also demonstrates how Green could have written the peripheral information into story material without needing to dedicate chapter length scenes to them. The framing of this scene is also pretty excellent. Aza is looking through photographs taken on her dad's old phone as she regales this memory to us. This is something that the medium of the written word is supremely good at, seamlessly weaving in and out of different but related stories. If Green wrote a whole lot more of these types of scenes, he can justify this thematically by tying it to Arza's OCD. Maybe her obsessive thoughts about herself lead her to constantly think over and recount the stories surrounding her life in order to piece together some sense of stability to her existential predicament. Instead of having her just blithely reaffirm that she's worried she might not be a singular self, have her tell the reader a brief story that details what led her down this line of philosophical inquiry. Okay, Okay, you might say that the main story of the novel is where this happens, but no, Aza already thinks this at the beginning of the novel. The very first line of the text begins, at the first time I realised I might be fictional. So we never actually get to read what led into this idea. I feel like there's an entire story's worth of material just in this one line, because what experience with a mental disorder leads a random 16 year old to think this? Unfortunately, because the story is told linearly and in the moment from a singular narrator's internally focalised perspective, we never get to go back and find out. Even so, there was a way to incorporate this using the narrator, but it just wasn't used. The story of the father's death could be expanded upon, but I don't think you need to because it's reasonably good as is, and this is what I would prefer over direct explanations. I don't want the ideas, story details, and character traits to just be summarised or discussed in soliloquy or dialogue. That's Boring. If this scene, yes it's a scene, were written in the style of the rest of Green's explanatory passages, it'd probably read something like, My dad died years ago, very suddenly. I'm still sad about it to this day. I can't not be sad about it. I'm sorry for the double negative, but it's a real double negative. <laughs> <laughs> Paper Towns is devoted in its entirety to destroying the lie of the manic pixie dream girl. The novel ends, this is not really a spoiler, with a young woman essentially saying, do you really still live in this fantasy land where boys can save girls by being romantically interested in them? I do not know how I could have been less ambiguous about this without calling the novel The Patriarchal Lie of the Manic Pixie Dream Girl Must Be Stabbed in the Heart and Killed. In Paper Towns, Margot is seemingly an intentional manic pixie dream girl. It's the sarcastic name given to a type of female wish fulfillment character typically intended to provide male audiences with the fantasy of a troublemaking, slightly crazy young girl who will bring childlike joy to your life but who is revealed to be suffering from some bullshit. I don't know, tropes, man, who gives a shit? Margot takes the main character on a wild night of crazy hijinks before having a seemingly deep emotional conversation with him and then disappearing all mysterious-like. Said main guy, Quentin, follows a trail of clues as to her whereabouts that he believes to have been deliberately left for him and tracks her to a specific location in the middle of nowhere. When he finds her, it's revealed that she's not the manic pixie dream girl he fantasised her to be, she never had any affections for him in the first place, and she actually didn't want him to find her. She is, in fact, a troubled teenager who has struggled with her parents and her identity, but who wants to tackle those issues on her own terms without the main character's involvement. She turns out to be remarkably 
ordinary in the end. This subversion of the manic pixie dream girl trope is bolstered by themes of how we perceive the other and the fallacious things we do in constructing our expectations of the people around us, but okay, not that I want to play defense for the manic pixie dream girl of all things, but Jesus Christ, why though? Of all the bad tropes and cliches in all of popular media, why must this one be destroyed, stabbed in the heart and killed, even back in 2008? And why is the entirety of the novel devoted to this message? Why couldn't it have been a minor subplot or even just an aside or... Hang on a second, I got this quote from a dozen fucking blogs. That's not a primary source. Okay, let's check the link to the actual Tumblr page where John Green said this real quick. Oh no! No! John, why do you do this to me? So how legitimate is this quote? Well, I mean, uh, the blogs are all pointing to the same URL, so, uh... I mean, it seems legitimate, I just wish I had the context for it, because the tone of this seems... oddly frustrated? Eh, I'm sure it's nothing. You know what I love about all of these blog posts? is that they've all just accepted the stated goal of the author and are discussing the novel on whether or not it achieved that, rather than asking more useful or dissecting questions like whether or not that stated goal is substantive enough to carry an entire novel, or whether the type of person who needs to be convinced by this subversion would even be reading Paper Towns in the first place, or if the goal is even achievable through contemporary media at all, and whether writing a visceral takedown of a single trope into what is essentially still supposed to be commercially viable entertainment is more akin to just screaming ineffectually into the void while nothing actually improves. Quick question. What is the point of subversion? Well, subversion has different meanings depending on the context, and in literature there's at least two very prominent definitions that can be broadly applied in a way that your average consumer will care about. Subversion in the context of sociopolitics often refers to a group that doesn't have political dominance attempting to attack and transform a structure of power. Oh god, I sound like a sociology professor. Now, art and entertainment can actually play a role in this, as both are often used as vessels for introducing ideas to an audience in novel ways, sometimes political ideas. So it's not inappropriate to say that a particular film, TV show, or book is subversive in the political sense. Now, another definition that has emerged from art and entertainment spheres is the idea that you can subvert either tropes or the audience's expectations for the purposes of engagement and entertainment of that audience. The idea is that by engaging in a healthy amount of subversion targeted at common tropes and expectations, Artists and entertainers will avoid falling into too many cliches and the audiences won't get bored when they go to the movies expecting a new and exciting experience. This type of subversion isn't necessarily politically motivated, but it's also important to note that it's not mutually exclusive from the political definition of subversion. You can subvert a trope in a way that surprises and entertains the audience while simultaneously delivering to them a radical and challenging political idea. In the case of Paper Towns, it seems as though the subversion version of the manic pixie dream girl trope was designed to do both. For the purposes of entertainment, the reader expects the boy to get with the girl at the end of the story, so it's supposedly both surprising and tragic when it turns out that he completely misjudged her and they go their separate ways instead. For the purposes of political subversion, the idea is that certain tropes and stereotypes involving women in fiction can inadvertently harm some women and girls in real life because it creates unreasonable or even false ideas and expectations about real women in the minds of audiences who uncritically consume media that earnestly portrays those tropes and stereotypes. Oh god, I sound like a media studies professor. Somebody kill me now. <laughs> Maybe this is because I'm completely uninformed, and also a man, but I wasn't convinced that the manic pixie dream girl is a trope that especially needs to be subverted. You know, a romance between a boring guy and a quirky childlike girl who shows him how to have fun but has unresolved emotional turmoil that the guy ends up helping her with doesn't sound like an offensive story in a vacuum. And I'm also not under the impression that it's an endemic cliché either because I never noticed the trope in the stuff that I watch. Now, you can say that if I have objections to this that I ought to become informed, 
and you're right, but that doesn't change the fact that I wasn't convinced by the novel itself, and so the failure of the subversion while I'm reading it dampens my enjoyment of the story. I might agree with it later, but the fact that it failed in the novel means I'm not enjoying reading it. On the entertainment side, the subversion in Paper Towns trips on the first hurdle if you're already familiar with John Green's other work, especially Looking for Alaska. I don't know about you, but when the gang set off on a road trip to find Margot, the last thing I was expecting was for them to find her congratulating Quentin at the end of the trail and rewarding him with a relationship. I fully expected either they weren't going to find her at all, or if they did, she actually wouldn't be happy about it. Paper Towns thoroughly failed to subvert my expectations for the story, and I found myself underwhelmed and bored. Now, I'll be the first to admit that's not a fair criticism, because it's not actually predicated on the content of the text, but that's the risk that you run when you're an author who is known for doing certain things. Your previous works can end up creating expectations that are a detriment to your audience's experience. If you're an aspiring writer who has hasn't established an audience yet, you might not think about this, but it is crucial to the success of your work to think about who might read it and how they might read it. At the most basic level, you can consider what broad audience you're expressly targeting, but you can also subdivide within that audience. Timmy or Tammy, Johnny or Jenny, Spike. For example, John Green targets young adults with his novels, but within that larger demographic there are subsets who might respond very differently, including young adults who aren't familiar with his novels and will be picking up Paper Towns as their first entry into his work, but also young adults who have read his other novels and will be coming into Paper Towns with pre-established expectations. Now, those aren't the only two subsets, and I'm certain that Green actually does give a lot of consideration to this, but the fact of the matter is that authors kind of have to make an informed guess as to which subset divisions of their target audience will be more important than others, and it's not really feasible to please everyone to the highest possible degree. It's possible that Green did consider how pre-established expectations might affect a reading of his work, but may have just unfortunately underestimated exactly how important it was for a sizable number of readers. Paper Towns is the only John Green novel where the reading experience for me was intensely displeasurable for the overwhelming majority of the book. The subversion of the manic pixie dream girl trope failed for me on both both counts, but it honestly wouldn't have been a deal breaker if Green hadn't staked the success of the novel on that subversion. When the moment of subversion is done at the climax, it just has to land or else the climax is ruined. If the climax doesn't work and the build-up for it is transparent to the point of frustration, then I'm sorry, but the entire story just feels bad to read. So Arza crashes her car. Holmesy! she shouted, but too late. I looked up only in time to see that I'd kept accelerating while the traffic had slowed. I couldn't okay, I'm actually not going to talk about the crash itself because the way it's written is actually not that interesting, but I'd like to touch on the lead up to the crash. I'm not going to cover all of it because it's incredibly long and dense, but there are a couple of beats that I have objections to. So Daisy is ranting at Arza about how she doesn't know anything about Daisy's life because she hasn't bothered to get to know her properly. At first it seems like Daisy has a point because Arza can't remember her parents' names, but when she gets around to the pets, there's a bit of a turnaround. We're supposed to be best friends, Holmesy, and you don't even know if I have any fucking pets? You have no idea what it's like for me, and you're so, like, pathologically uncurious that you don't even know what you don't know. You have a cat, I whispered. You just have no fucking clue. It's also fucking easy for you. You don't know what it's like for me, and you don't ask. I share a room with my annoying eight-year-old sister, whose name you don't know, and then you judge me for buying a car instead of saving it all for college, but you don't know. Her name is Eleanor, I said quietly. You think it's hard for you, and I'm sure it is from inside your head, but you can't get it, because your privileges are just oxygen to you. 
Having Arza give correct responses to Daisy's attacks and then having Daisy ignore them paints Daisy as being in the wrong, especially since this passage is using irony against Daisy by having her rant about how Arza never listens to her while she fails to listen to Arza. This isn't even that Daisy is painted as unsympathetic by Arza being the perspective character because Arza is actually showing her up by answering her correctly. Aza also ends up getting the final word in the argument, which is another way of signalling victory through the structure of the encounter. I'm not saying that I agree with Daisy 100%, but I feel like there's sufficient room here for a discussion on the relationship between these two characters that gets stifled by the fact that Green is painting Daisy as being the unsympathetic, self-centred, whining bitch in this scene. If you just remove Arza's responses and let Daisy rant uninterrupted, that wouldn't run the risk of painting Daisy in the right because the reader knows Arza's side of the story and can sympathise with Arza's perspective in this confrontation already. If Green just gave us Daisy's perspective without comment or judgement, we could maybe weigh up and discuss the relationship that they have, argue about who has a legitimate take on which particular things and who more to change. This is a complex and nuanced confrontation, but the framing of the conflict kinda just gives Arza the win, and I think that's emblematic of a lot of problems when it comes to the messages of Green's stories. I don't want to assume too much of Green's intent, but it reads to me like he's not interested in provoking people to think for themselves as he is in just telling us what he thinks. Now just as a side note, that's probably not true. Green, from what I can tell, seems like the kind of guy who wants to encourage people to think for themselves, but it didn't come off that way in his novels, so I would still consider that a failure on the part of how it was executed in the novels. Daisy's accusing rant distracts Arza from driving and Arza crashes the car and ends up in hospital. Yeah, Arza's the one driving Daisy around and Daisy starts a harsh argument that pulls her mentally ill friend's attention from the road. Do you think the scene might be trying to paint Daisy in an unsympathetic light perhaps? Something that I actually like about this hospital scene is that Arza's reminded the reader several times during the novel that hospital is where she's actually the most likely to contract C. diff, the bug that's been the mascot of her obsessive fears. See, I told you John Green has great storytelling moxie when it comes to themes but like bloody everything in this book by now, the stuff on the surface is where it totally fails to connect. Thoughts are just a different kind of bacteria colonising you. I thought about the gut-brain information axis. Maybe you're already gone. The prisoners run the jail now. Not a person so much as a swarm. Not a bee, but the hive. I couldn't stand my mother's breath on my face. My palms were sweating. I felt myself slipping away. You know how to deal with this. Can you turn over? I whispered, but she responded only with breath. You just need to stand up. I picked up my phone to text Daisy, but now the letters blurred out on the screen and the full panic gripped me. See the hand sanitizer mounted on the wall near the door? It's the only way. That's stupid. If it worked, alcoholics would be the healthiest people in the world. You're just going to sanitize your hand and your mouth? Please fucking think about something else. Stand up. I hate being stuck inside you. You are me. I am not. You are we. I am not. You want to feel better. You know how to feel better. It'll just make you buff. You'll be clean. You can be sure. I can never be sure. Stand up. Not even a person. Just a deeply flawed line of reasoning. You want to stand up. The doctor says stay in bed and the last thing needed is a surgery. You'll get up and wheel your IV cart. Let me up out of this. You'll wheel your IV cart to the front of the room, please. And you will pump the hand sanitizer foam into your hands, clean them carefully, and then you'll pump more foam into your hands and you'll put that foam in your mouth, swish it around your filthy teeth and gums. But that stuff has alcohol in it that my damaged liver will have to process. Do you want to die of C. diff? No, but this isn't rational. Then get up and wheel your IV cart to the container of hand sanitizer mounted on the goddamn wall, you idiot. Please let me go. I'll do anything. I'll stand down. You can have this body. I don't want it anymore. You will stand up. I will not. You will stand up. I am my way, not my will. You will stand up. Please, you will go to the hand sanitizer. Cogito ergo non sum. Sweating. You you already have it. Nothing hurts like this. You've already got it. Stop. Please, God, stop. You'll never be free of this. You'll never be free of this. You'll never get yourself back. You'll never get yourself back. Do you want to die of this? Do you want to die of this? Because you will. Because you will. You will. You will. You will. You will. 
I have gone back and forth on this passage so many times for so many reasons, because when I look at this passage in transcript, it's like, fine. Taken in isolation, there's nothing wrong with this passage that I haven't already mentioned. Like, okay, maybe the second voice in italics still isn't the best way to convey this, and I think the you will, you will, you will at the end of the passage is <laughs> it's honestly very silly, but ignoring those things, like, the passage is fine. It's very clear what it's trying to convey, it's using literary form, it's emotionally resonant, and it really captures that overwhelming sense of being in conflict with yourself. If I actually had an emotional reaction to this scene, I'd be praising it for being good writing. But when I first read this passage in the novel, it just didn't connect. I think because my disbelief wasn't suspended. I think the problem, counterintuitively, might be that Green's theming and ideas were too clear. Because I was very aware of exactly what Green is trying to put forward in this novel, the emotional impact of this moment becomes undercut by its practical purpose within the narrative becoming exceptionally obvious. Like, I realise the irony of this, considering I've been trying to tell you all of the things that the novel is doing under the hood for ages by now, but as much as I like being able to see and talk about how a story is put together, I don't exactly want to be thinking about this while I'm reading the story for the first time. If it's my first time reading the passage and I think to myself, oh, I see, this is the intense and bleak part that creates a climax for this character and the theme, then I'm clearly not immersed in the story. This is the problem that writers run into when their work is too devoted to delivering a specific message and they want that message to be as clear as day. If the message takes priority over the story, that's what your audience will be primarily engaged with. So even if you have really good story moments, your audience has still heard you speaking to them from behind that curtain and, for some of them at least, the illusion simply cannot be believed after that. I'm not saying that no one would find this passage compelling. After all, how easily you can suspend your disbelief differs from person to person, but I'm someone who can't suspend my disbelief very easily, and I didn't buy the illusion during this passage. I'm sure it's a genuinely powerful scene to some people, but I just couldn't feel any of that power for myself. So continuing on, John Green has the narration break down to the point where Arza begins writing the story in second person. Yes, second person. The next morning, you wake up in a hospital bed, staring up at ceiling tiles. Gingerly, carefully, you assess your own consciousness for a moment. You wonder, is it over? You think, it's like a brain fire, like a rodent gnawing at you from the inside, a knife in your gut, a spiral, whirlpool, black hole. The words used to describe it, despair, fear, anxiety, obsession, do so little to communicate it. Maybe we invented metaphor as a response to pain. Maybe we needed to give shape to the opaque, deep down pain that evades both sense and sense. For a moment, you think you're better. You've just had a successful train of thought with an engine and a caboose and everything. Your thoughts, authored by you. And then you feel a wave of nausea, a fist clenching from within your rib cage, Cold sweat, hot forehead. You've got it. It's already inside of you, crowding out everything else, taking you over. And it's going to kill you and eat its way out of you. And then in a small voice, half strangled by the ineffable horror, you barely squeeze out the words you need to say. I'm in trouble, Mum. Big trouble. So, why second person narration? Well, this scene is the culmination of three of the novel's main interests. The two core themes of mental illness and self-authorship, as well as the third major theme of the limitations of language. The self-authorship theme is illustrated, first of all, by Arza literally losing her perspective to the reader, but secondly, through the reader having their experience narrated to them. While the reader occupies Arza's perspective, they are being told everything that's happening to them and what their thoughts are without any agency on their part. For the culmination of the mental illness theme, one of the supposed goals of the novel was to give readers an idea of what it's like to live with OCD. Or 
at least for John Green to express what it's like for him to live with OCD. To that end, the reader is now literally occupying the perspective of a character with OCD and being told that they're having the experience of a mental health patient. The limitations of language are talked about explicitly by the narrator, but more subtly, Green is showing that it takes creative use of literary form to better illustrate his core message. He can't simply tell you directly with words what Arza is going through, so he's done this wild and wacky artistic thing that conveys his ideas better than literal terminology can. Not only is this passage an excellent culmination of many of the novel's themes, but it's an example of a pretty sick use of second-person narration. That's not to say that it's well written, though, and it still suffers from the inescapable random musings which, I mean, what do you expect at this point? This is the perfect summation of my opinion of John Green as an author. His ideas and storytelling moxie are Mwah, they're so good, I love them. But the writing is terrible! When Green switches to second person narration, it's actually an exceptional use of literary form. He does it with purpose and he uses the narration to create meaning that otherwise isn't simply provided by musings or story beats. I want Green to try this more often. He very obviously has the ability to take command over literary form and create something substantial out of it. I'm just baffled that a sizable chunk of the rest of the novel is droll bollocks compared to this. I should clarify again that I'm not asking Green to be cryptic and make his underlying meaning completely inaccessible to the teen readers. Use of literary form doesn't mean that you have to heavily obscure the meaning of the text or make the story harder to pass. I know that the teenager audience is the priority for these novels and that they need to be able to understand what's going on, but I think using literary form and storytelling to create meaning would make for a far superior reading experience, even for the teen audience. I just hate it when instead of of reading a story, I'm being talked at by a smarmy know-it-all narrator. Speaking of which... The arc of the story goes like this. Having descended into proper madness, I began to make the connections that crack open the long dormant case of Russell Pickett's disappearance. My dogged obsessiveness leads me to ignore all manner of threats and the risk to the fortune Daisy and I have stumbled into. I focus only on the mystery and embrace the belief that solving it is the ultimate good, that declarative sentences are inherently better than interrogative ones, and in finding the answer despite my madness, I simultaneously find a way to live with the madness. I become a great detective, not in spite of my brain circuitry, but because of it. I'm not sure who I walk into the sunset with in the proper story, Davis or Daisy, but I walk into it. You see me backlit, an eclipse silhouetted by the eight-minute-old light of our home star, holding hands with somebody. And along the way, I realise that I have agency over myself, that my thoughts are, as Dr. Singh liked to say, only thoughts. I realise my life is a story that I'm telling, and I'm free and empowered and the captain of my own consciousness, and yeah, no, that's not how it went down. I did not become dogged or declarative, nor did I walk off into the sunset. In fact, for a while there, I saw hardly any natural light at all. What happened was relentlessly and excruciatingly dull. I lay in a hospital bed and hurt. My ribs hurt, my brain hurt, my thoughts hurt, and they did not let me go home for eight days. Oh look! It's the thesis statement! Mental illness is highly stigmatized in our culture, but it is also sometimes romanticized. We see TV shows where in order to catch a terrorist, a mentally ill person must go off their meds. Or we see obsessive detectives whose obsessiveness allows them to crack cases that others couldn't. That kind of thing might be true to some people's experiences, but it hasn't been true to mine. Like, I don't feel like my mental illness has any superpower side effects. In fact, when I'm stuck inside a thought spiral, I find it very difficult to observe, like, anything outside of my I become a terrible detective. Film and TV shows intended to be escapist fantasies feature a romanticized and exaggerated portrayal of their subject matter. You don't say! Never have I thought of such a notion. I'll repeat what I said for the Manic Pixie Dream Girl thing. I didn't find it surprising or cathartic, so it didn't contribute to my entertainment, and it also didn't convince me to change my mind or take on new ideas. I mean, in this case, isn't it possible to argue that 
the mentally ill characters getting to save the day with their unique ways of thinking is actually, like, positive representation for mentally ill people. I mean, I can't speak on their behalf, and for real, I don't actually believe this, but it's such an obvious angle to consider. Like, it's the first thing that popped into my mind when I heard Gwyn explain this, and again, as someone who is completely uninformed, when I see a counterpoint that obvious left totally unaddressed, it erodes my confidence in Green's position because it once again looks like he's ignoring rather straightforward objections to his argument. Now, you could say that if I have objections to this, that I ought to become informed, and you're right, but does that actually help me with my exp- you get the idea, whatever. But more to the point, I just had you all read a passage that states an opinion and then showed you a vlog where Green states that exact same opinion. I feel like that says something about the way this was executed in the novel, that the message was adapted into vlog format totally unscathed. You remember that Tumblr post that no longer exists? Well, someone copied it in full on Reddit, and it turns out to actually be about how Green at the time was very frustrated with all of the bad faith criticism he was getting. The person whose message incited the post basically flat out accused Green of romanticizing illness and death to a young audience. And in his response, Green references random Tumblr posts that get passed around and an article published by the Daily Mail that all make that same same accusation. In this video, I've tried to take the broad criticisms levied at Green and either contextualize or justify them somewhat, but it would be dishonest for me to ignore that John Green receives a lot of bad faith criticism that gets parroted and repeated. Now, that makes me nervous that I may have contributed to that, however I've tried to make arguments based on what I actually read and support what I say with evidence, so I hope my criticisms were all in good faith. Now that was the post in full, but there's another segment in the middle of it all that is actually very relevant to this video in particular. There are a lot of weaknesses in my books. I am not that great of a writer. I am happy to acknowledge these weaknesses. My plots are thin. I'm too fond of turning phrases. Imagistic stuff gets fogged up by my inconsistent usage. I care too much about ideas and not enough about story. There's a kind of emotional disengagement in my work. Like I'm always trying to make you conscious of the fact that this is a fiction. And look at all the things this fiction is doing. Which leads to people seeing the strings on the puppets and feeling pulled out of the narrative. So, yeah, my criticisms aren't anything new, and yes, John Green himself is already very aware of most of the things that I've said in this video. I never actually made this video to give feedback to John Green. In fact, I'm pretty sure John Green doesn't need my feedback. My criticisms were mainly as a showcase to help all of the aspiring writers out there, really. Was my criticism useful, though? Did I actually make any helpful or defensible arguments in this video? I don't fucking know. You're the audience, you tell me. The real reason why I made this video is because after I read The Fault in Our Stars and couldn't articulate exactly what my thoughts were, I turned to the internet to see if someone else could articulate my thoughts for me, and boy, that was a mistake. So for all of the people out there with similar feelings to me, I'm hoping that they run into this video not so that they can repeat my points verbatim, but so I can provoke them to think about Green's novels in different and more sophisticated ways that might help them better articulate themselves. But, like it or not, one of the practical functions of critics is that they give language to the thoughts and feelings of others, so all critics have a responsibility to be honest, especially when it comes to reviewing media targeted at young people. Young people far more often need assistance to articulate their thoughts with confidence and precision, so just speaking to them in rhetoric and buzzwords doesn't do them any good. This isn't about letting them truthfully express their opinions to others as much as it is letting them truthfully express their thoughts thoughts to themselves. Self-expression isn't always just an outward performance. Much more often we all need to enunciate our thoughts to ourselves in order to really understand them. Once upon a time, I only ever paid attention to the most popular advertised and talked about media because I couldn't express to myself exactly what my thoughts and interests were. And I often repeated the most catchy, widespread rhetoric even in spite of my own experiences to the contrary. It's 
unnerving to think that back when I lacked the language to give form to my own experiences, that my thoughts and behaviour were hijacked by invasive ideas. Wait, hang on a second. Well, that's it. I'm never making another video on John Green ever again. I've made my peace with this. I can move on. I have closed the book on my opinions of John Green as a writer. It's done, and I never have to think about- I'm here basically to tell them to like my book, I guess? My book that they cannot currently read, but uh, it's coming out. September 25th. It's got a release date, John. Son of a bitch!